Henry was active in the Markham Methodist Church, where he served as organist for many years. He was taught to play by Miss Taylor from the vicarage of St. Bride's Anglican Church. He died, March 22, 1928. Andy CIS lived on until September 1954. One story connected with Henry has been told to me by Avril Lambert. It concerns money held in chancery. No doubt many colonists had similar stories, probably the sum concerned grew as time progressed. Family oral history claims that Henry went back to England in an effort to establish a connection with a rich shipping relative who had left a large sum of money in chancery. Apparently Henry's trip was unsuccessful. It is also suggested that his parents had tried to claim the money before they left to emigrate to New Zealand, with equal lack of success. Arthur Aspden did work for Tom Aspden at Woolies Bay, near Matapri, for a time during 1900 and 1901. Later he went to Gisborne where he married Alice Rachel Hart on June 13, 1906, or possibly 1907, who was living for a time in Gisborne before settling in Wairoa. They had a large family. Althor died November 5, 1956. Fanny Aspden then worked for Mackay Logan and called well as an underwear designer and cutter. In that position she was able to help May Aspden, the daughter of James Archibald and Ellen Aspden, to get her first job in the same firm. Fanny married Ernest Maxwell Bedford, a butcher from Dargaville on September 5, 1922. Incidentally Richard Herc, who died just before the family reunion, was their best man. They lived for two or three years in Dargaville before moving to Rotorua where they lived until around 1930. The family then moved to Mount Wellington in Auckland where later, Fanny died on November 10, 1949. An interesting comment on how big families soon lose contact was encountered by Phil Graham in investigating the Bedford family. She found that her niece, Renee and her husband Owen Williams were neighbors and good friends of Leslie and Mavis Bedford, without realizing that Renee and Leslie were second cousins. Chapter 6 Alice and Randolph Smith Mary Alice Aspden was born July 27, 1869 at the Maku. She was generally known to family members as Alice. Phyllis Graham understands that she was born with a rare condition called a cull or monk's cow. Perhaps it was not the first time Alice had seen a baby born with one, but this time it was her own child. Old wives' tales say that it marks an outstanding child and one who will be both protected and lucky. It is not known if this was the case but certainly she lived to a good old age of 85. All of Alice's schooling would probably have been at Moku School because she was 14 when her parents moved to Auckland. Alice's description of life at Moku has already been mentioned in Chapter 3. No doubt she was happy to move to the civilization of Auckland. Memories of the hardship suffered by the housewives in those pioneer days stayed with her as she described them in the article. Alice married Randolph Percy Smith a blacksmith from Fielding on April 29, 1893 at New Plymouth and apparently they settled in Taranaki and later moved to the Manawatu area for a period. Randolph was listed as living in Bunnythrop, near Palmerston North in the 1901 Wises Directory. They later returned to Auckland after 1910, and were living for many years at Castor Bay, where Randolph continued to work as a blacksmith. They were both long-serving members of the Salvation Army. The war cry reports of their deaths confirmed their long years of service. They moved across town to Mount Albert shortly before Randolph died in 1941. Alice lived on for almost 14 years, later dying in 1955. They had one son, Albert, born February 3, 1894 in New Plymouth. Albert later married Margaret Knight in 1919. As a teacher he served in various schools around the country, including the spell of six years in the intermediate department at Northcote District High School, later to become Northcote College in 1947, from February 1945 to December 1950. Albert retired from teaching in 1950, 
after 40 years devoted to boys and girls in various schools. He must therefore have been a near contemporary of Hubert Cooper, see Chapter 11, at Teachers College. Chapter 7 The Turley Family Notes by Phil Graham and Avril Lambert Margaret Aspden was the youngest child of Henry and Alice Aspden. She was born at Amalco on June 26, 1874. She was 22 years younger than her eldest brother James, and was about 10 years of age when her parents shifted to the Boston Road property. She probably worked as a seamstress. She later married William Turley. He was born April 5, 1873 in England and came to New Zealand with his parents when he was just five. His family lived on Burla Street, just around the corner from Boston Road. Perhaps the two young people went to the same school together. In any event they were married on December 30, 1896 from Margaret's parents' house in Boston Road, and the ceremony was held at the Methodist Church in Grafton Road, later replaced by Trinity College, a training college for Methodist ministers. William was a coach painter who worked for a firm associated with decorating the coaches of the day. His fine and painstaking work with gilding was also in demand when the various coats of arms around the city had to be touched up, especially for visiting royalty. Later he worked in a similar fashion for the New Zealand Railways for the rest of his working life. When they were married their first home was in Boston Road in the house next door to the Eastons. Later they would move to Newton, and then on to New Bond Street. After this there were several different addresses in Mount Albert. Their last house at Fraser Avenue, in the same district, was built by Gordon Hansen, who was married to their niece, Ada Aspden. The Turleys had three girls, Dora, Elva and Phyllis. Dora, born in 1897 was a tailoress at Hugh Wright's. She married Richard Herc, head tailor at the same firm, but she died early at age 49 leaving Richard and three children. Elva, also died young, at age 45 when she suffered a stroke. Elva had married Harley Nightingale, a minister, who had many different parishes around the North Island. Elva and Harley had six children. Phyllis, the youngest, was born in 1908. She married Wesley Graham in 1933 and they spent most of their married life working in the Pacific Islands where Wesley was a school teacher. They had no family. I am told that when Phyllis and Wesley first began courting in Auckland that did not know their two families had already been associated, that Wesley's mother had also lived in Maku. She, then a Miss Wright, attended the same school and church as Alice and Maggie Aspden, Phyllis's mother. To cap it all Wesley's father taught at Moku School. Wesley died in 1958. Chapter 8 The Ferguson Family There is little definite information about the parents or background of Thomas Ferguson and Margaret Mago or, currently available. Eve Clark, granddaughter of Jemima, née Ferguson, and Johnson Clark, and Edith Cooper have provided some oral history which I record here. Eva Clark tells me that Thomas Ferguson was descended from the Covenanters of Scotland. These were adherents of Presbyterianism and who were persecuted by King Charles II and James II following the Restoration until the latter was deposed from the throne in 1688. It is suggested that Thomas struck an officer while in the army, then deserted. He traveled around Ireland as a harvester where he met Margaret Mucko Orr whose family were landowners in Ballymena, County Antrim. They married and lived first in County Antrim, and then went to Scotland where they lived in Dundee, Inverness, and Edinburgh, from where the family embarked for South Africa. Notes from Edith Cooper suggest that the marriage was strongly opposed by her parents. He was only a gardener and class distinction came into it. She was determined to marry him and was disowned. So the story goes. Thomas Ferguson was younger than Margaret McCore and was apparently born around 1820, probably in Scotland. Margaret was born in Ballymena on June 4, 1815. They married on August 23, 1838 in Glasgow, according to her death certificate. Eva Clark understands that it was not Glasgow, but in Northern Ireland. 
Their first son, John Ferguson, was born about 1839 but died in infancy. William John was born on September 4, 1841 in County Antrim. Isabel Ferguson may also have been born there, around 1843. The family must have moved to Dundee in Scotland, for the remainder of the children were all born there. Jane Natchez and Ferguson on August 28, 1845, Thomas Jr. about 1849, Margaret Ferguson in 1852, Jemima in 1855 and lastly, Mary Ann and Ferguson in 1856. Presumably, shortly after Mary Ann's birth the family emigrated to the Cape Colony, South Africa. It is suggested that Thomas served in the army there. However, considering the relatively short stay of about six years, from 1858 to 1864, it is more likely that they intended to settle, but in the event found conditions unsatisfactory. It is likely that during their time in the Cape Colony, the Fergusons became friendly with the Frasers and we will review that family in the next chapter. In 1864, as part of the special Waikato immigration scheme, mentioned earlier in Chapter 2, suitable immigrants were sought in South Africa as well as Britain. The appendices to the Journal of the House of Representatives, AJHR, of 1864, contains a letter from the agent in Cape Town which describes the response the advertisement received there. The instructions, from the New Zealand government, could not have arrived at a better time, trade being very dull here, excepting the breakwater. No public works going on and in consequence a great number of good skillful mechanics and laborers out of employ. On one single advertisement I had more than 1,000 applicants, and so great was the rush that the windows of my store were broken, and I was obliged to send for the police to disperse the crowd. The Fergusons and the Frasers must have been in that first rush because they were successful in being selected to emigrate to New Zealand. For some reason, William, together with a friend Robert Taylor, who was to be William's best man and also brother-in-law when he married Isabella, paid their own passage and traveled on the first ship, the 340-ton Steinritter. She left the Cape on August 17, 1864 and arrived in Auckland on October 14, 1864. The Voyage reported in the New Zealand Herald of October 15, 1864 was uneventful. The land grant register for the Steinritter lists them as William Ferguson, aged 23 years, birthplace Scotland, occupation shoemaker Robert Taylor, aged 27 years, birthplace Scotland, occupation carpenter. The rest of the family followed three months later as assisted immigrants on the 814 ton ship Eveline, leaving the Cape on December 2, 1864 and arriving in Auckland on January 22, 1865. Another uneventful voyage reported in the New Zealand Herald of January 23, 1865. For some reason the passenger list in the paper was not complete and did not include the Frasers who also travelled on the ship. The land grant register for the Eveline listed the family as Thomas Ferguson, 47 years, married boatmaker Margaret Ferguson, 45 years, married Isabel Ferguson, 21 single, Jane Ferguson, 19 single, Thomas Ferguson, 17 single, Margaret Ferguson, 12 single, Jemima Ferguson, 9 single, Mary Ann Ferguson, 8 single. The ages listed are interesting because Thomas was 44 and Margaret 49 at the time, if my birth date information is correct. Was there some stigma at the time of a younger man marrying an older woman? Also note his stated trade, perhaps he considered that this would improve his prospects of being selected to emigrate. Incidentally also on this ship, as well as the Fergusons and Frasers were the Mercer family, more of them later, and the Knott family of Charles, Mary Ann, Elizabeth, Fanny and Jane. Mary Ann must have been widowed in South Africa, former husband George Elms, and married Charles Knott shortly before emigrating to New Zealand. Fanny Knott was three years old then and later married Henry Asp Den Jr. in 1882. Thomas Ferguson was granted five acres in the Pukekohe area, number 73, 
Section number one, but it is not clear whether he took up the option or not. The reason for William proceeding ahead as he did, could well have been that this ploy would ensure a larger better placed allocation of land. The letter in the 1864 AJHR mentioned earlier, stated that the non-steerage passengers who paid their own passage were granted non land orders of general country land, each according to the enclosed counterfoils. I know no more than this as of writing at present. Eva Clark tells me that the Fergusons lived first on Constitution Hill, near the present High Court, then in Seafield View Road, Grafton, and finally at Mount Smart Road, Penrose. The final move was made around 1875 to apparently lots 15 and 16, section 17. Thomas was described in the electoral role as a gardener. Margaret died in Mount Smart Road, on April 21, 1889 at the age of 73. Thomas also died at Mount Smart on May 30, 1894, again aged 73 years. Thomas Jr. who lived with his family for more than 10 years in Duke Street, Newton had moved out to Mount Smart next door to his father around the time when his mother died. He and his wife Emily probably looked after Thomas for the remaining five years, because he was bequeathed all his father's estate, apart from some small sums of money left to some of his daughters. William and Isabella weren't even mentioned in the will incidentally. Now for some brief notes about the family, except for William, of whom there is a review in the next chapter. Some of the information is provided by Eva Clark from a much more detailed family chart. Isabel married William's friend Robert Taylor. They had four sons and one daughter and the family lived in Newton. One of the sons, Robert Jr., settled with his wife Rose and family in Birkenhead where later they seemed to have been friends with Tom and Catherine Aspden. Jane married Carl Hansen, a painter and decorator from Germany around 1873. There is a tantalizing glimpse of Carl Hansen's life in the Cyclopedia of New Zealand. Their only daughter Charlotte, married her first cousin Alec Ferguson, who became a partner with his father-in-law in the decorating business. All four lived in Simons Street until about the time that Carl Hansen died, 1906, when they moved out to Ellerslie. Thomas Jr. married Emily Jane Kemp in February 1880. He started work with the New Zealander as an apprentice on arrival in Auckland in 1865. When this paper folded he was taken over as a turnover apprentice by the Daily Southern Cross and Weekly News in 1865. The New Zealand Herald took over this paper and Thomas with it. He stayed with the New Zealand Herald until he retired in 1926, aged 76 and after 61 years on newspapers in Auckland. Tom died at Take Hall Rue on June 8, 1933 and Emily died in Auckland Hospital on March 22, 1936. Margaret married Edward Cartwright, a carpenter, in March 1878. They lived at Take Hall near Dargaville, for a time, but moved back to live in Auckland during the early 1990s. Margaret lived to the considerable old age of 99. Jemima married Johnson Clark on New Year's Day in 1878. Johnson was employed by His Majesty's Customs and family lived in the Oraki area. One of their sons, Johnson Jr., an architect in Auckland for many years, was father of Eva Clark who has provided so much of this information. Another of their sons, Frederick Clark is still alive, when I last talked to Eva Clark, February 1981. The last of the grandchildren of Thomas and Margaret, he is 93 this year. The youngest daughter, Mary Ann Clark married William Keith in May 1874. They and their family were pioneering settlers in the Tekawata, Mungatoyuri area and descendants still farm in the district. Further details of the families are shown on the family tree. Chapter 9 The Fraser Family Less is known about the origins of the Fraser family and their time in New Zealand because there was little contact after William Ferguson's wife Margaret Fraser died in May 1887. 
information comes from two sources, the land allocation records for the ship Eveline and the death certificate of John Fraser, Margaret's father. John Fraser was born in Dundee, Scotland around 1816, the son of John Fraser, an auctioneer and his wife Mary Donaldson. We hear of him next at Woolwich, Kent where he married Catherine Archibald about 1844. He was possibly boat building there. Daughter Margaret was born there about 1846, as were probably John Thomas, John Jr., in 1848, Elizabeth in 1852 and Catherine in 1854. It is not known when the Frasers went to the Cape Colony, South Africa, but it was probably around 1854-1855 in which case Isabella, born 1855, Robert Archibald in 1856 and Jemima born in 1857, would all have been born in South Africa. I have no better information on this at present, and there is even a suggestion that Jemima was adopted, since in oral family history, the name Garnick is associated with Jemima. When Jemima married James Aspden in May 1876, the marriage certificate gives her name as Jemima Fraser, but the birth certificate of their daughter Alice gives Garnick as her maiden name. It is understood that John Fraser served for a short time in the army while serving in South Africa in the 73rd Regiment and was given his discharge before emigrating to New Zealand. As mentioned in the previous chapter, it is reasonable to assume that the Fraser family was friendly with the Ferguson family, and that it was more than good luck that they traveled to New Zealand on the same ship. The main reason for suggesting this is the fact that William Ferguson and Margaret Fraser only a few months after she arrived in Auckland, William was already there. The land grant register for the Evelyn listed the family as John Fraser 45 years married Carpenter Catherine Fraser 45 years married Margaret Fraser 18 years single John Fraser 16 years single Elizabeth Fraser 12 years single Catherine Fraser 10 years single Bella Fraser 9 years single Robert Fraser 8 years single Jemima Fraser 7 years single John Fraser was allocated a 5 acre suburban allotment in Padamejo, Lot 6, not far from John Mercer. Charles Knott, Henry Aspden and David Fullerton, who all had allotments in Padamejo as well. It is probable that apart from the initial period in a transit camp while the survey was being completed, the Fraser family moved out to Putamejo as soon as they could. Presumably they faced the same problems and hardships as those already described which faced the Aspdens. John Fraser Jr. married Margaret Fullerton daughter of David Fullerton of Padamejo. They lived for a time in Willow Street, probably in the Freeman's Bay area, but soon moved to Devonport, sometime in the 1880s where they lived at 26 Glen Road, Stanley Point. Elizabeth Fraser married Charles Gillander, the son of neighbors in Drake Street, Freeman's Bay, in March 1877. They lived in the Pukikohe area for a while but shortly after 1886, moved to Narua Wahio where Charles took up the position of engineer to the New Zealand Dairy Association, the main dairy company in the area. There is a brief entry about Charles Gillander in the Cyclopedia of New Zealand, and a photo of Charles and Elizabeth. They had five sons and three daughters. Catherine Fraser married James Prescott in May 1885. He was a farmer in the Ruakakwa area of Northland where his family were farming also. They probably returned there but appeared to have moved elsewhere not long after. There are no further family details at present. Isabel was working as a servant for the wife of Mr. Francis Quick, a coachmaker in 1877, aged 21, when she was mysteriously drowned on December 16, 1877. It caused a considerable stir in the newspapers for a week after, and the two-day coroner's inquest produced a verdict which did not satisfy the newspapers, who considered the result of the inquest to have been of a most unsatisfactory nature. Certainly John and Catherine Fraser, her parents, were most unhappy with the result. In 1878, J. B. Hanford, a solicitor in Auckland, 
wrote to the Minister of Justice on behalf of the Frasers asking to reopen the case, claiming that there was sufficient evidence to show that she was foully murdered. This was done, but the police report, together with the letter above, contained in an armed constabulary report in the National Archives, decided that the suspicions entertained by the mother of the deceased girl are without foundation. By the time the reply was received, John Fraser's health was so bad that this unsatisfactory conclusions appears to have remained unchallenged. John Fraser died two months later, probably hastened to his grave by the bitter experience of the previous months. Robert Archibald Fraser's wife was Annie Murphy and they were married about 1879. Robert was also a shipwright and lived most of his life in the Freeman's Bay areas. The other two daughters are mentioned elsewhere, Margaret Fraser in Chapter 10 and Jemima Fraser in Chapter 4.